Welcome to Cragamore. I'm Ulrich. Which of you men calls himself Valerian? We are here on behalf of... I know why you are here. You're a delegation from Urland, which is beyond Dalvesia. Let's see the artifacts. Scales. How did you come by these? I found them at the mouth of the lair. What else? A claw. That's no claw by the gods. It's a tooth. You want me to do battle with that? Who else can we turn to? Did you, did you try the Meridid sisters? What about Rimbard? I, I heard tell he killed a dragon once. They're all dead. You're the only one left. There's a long way to Ireland. Twice each year, at the spring and autumn equinox, the king selects a new victim. Virgins. A lottery. Barbaric. And in return, this dragon, he leaves your villages and crops unburned. Your king's made a pact with a monster. Master, don't you think... Silence. Are you afraid of dragons? No. In fact, if it weren't for sorcerers, there wouldn't be any dragons. Once the skies were dotted with them. Magnificent horned backs, leathern wings, soaring in their hot breath wind. Oh, I know this creature of yours. Vermithrax pejorative. Look at these scales, these ridges. When a dragon gets this old, it knows nothing but pain, constant pain. He grows decrepit, crippled, pitiful, spiteful. Will you help us? This is the emergency podcast system. This is not a test. Movies are bombing all over the country. They are posing as movies you already know. They may already be in your theaters, your neighbor's home, or even your own. Do not panic. Specialists have been dispatched. They will help you identify these pretenders and defend you against this invasion of the remake. Please stand by for further instructions. Welcome to the Invasion of the Remake podcast and the first episode of 2020. Ironically, our 220th episode, Dragon Slayer. I'd roar, but I'd sound awful. Almost as awful as the roar well, in the movie. If we had Benedict Cumberbatch, you could give us proper dragon roar. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I'm not Benedict Cumberbatch. No, because you are Sam Stepanenko. I am. And Trish uh, caught everything over the yeah. christmas holidays and became her uh, own grandmother yes. on her deathbed how are I you Trish? I, I don't know i could do a sad roar for you ah. <laughs> that was very sad yeah um, yes. i'm gonna, yeah agreed yeah yeah that uh, verging on pathetic <laughs> but i don't know if it's because my body was like hey let's do a movie where one of the characters pretends to be a dude and fuck up her voice real good <laughs> The, she's the no go motion dragon. Yes, yes. Yeah. I'm the evil. Actually, I think I probably could voice the little evil babies. Yeah, Arr. the little little. Yeah, baby that dragon. worked. That, that actually, was nowhere near as pathetic. Yeah, that wasn't so bad. There we go. If you just let the natural like guttural roll in your throat <laughs> happening. <Arr>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that goes into a cough. Fun. So we thought we'd start off with a bang with Dragon Slayer and Trisha's grandmother. Please sit back uh, until you need to. It's fine if she's a little quiet today. You all understand. Yeah. 
because she was force choked <laughs> yes. by Darth Vader. I know. Well, I but I mean, I still survived, so I won that fucking fight. <laughs> <laughs> You also won that fight with uh, last week's special episode, mm-hmm. cult movie trailer, A Go-Go, to The Revenge. I got my special treat. She did. She did. Somehow it became the bunnying. Mm-hmm. But I made it work. Yes. I made it work. Yes. <laughs> you did. <laughs> so I'm happy about that. As long as there was a compromise, and now she is terrified of bunnies. Everything worked. Everybody should be terrified of bunnies. Well, I mean, they should be terrified of their pee. It never leaves. That smell never leaves. It never leaves. <laughs> I, knew I wish you could have seen Jay's eyes. <laughs> I knew people. How do you know this? <laughs> I had friends who had bunnies. And honestly, that's a... Ah, it's, it is. It's worse than cat pee. Yes. Okay. That's gross. Yeah. What about dragon pee? I'm sure that's pretty pungent. Do not be a smoker. I no. wonder... They, they would probably go up. Most likely... I wonder if it burns when they pee. That's a good sign. (laughs) Well, she's still funny. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I can barely talk, but I've got the ideas in here. (laughs) So we're going to attempt to remake Dragon Slayer today. And I'm saying the name slowly because around the same time the Dragon's Lair game came out, so it's like dragon apostrophe ass layer. And it, it, I always would mix up the two when I said it because I'd say it really fast. Dragon Slayer, because it is all one word, and Dragon Slayer. Yes. It's very close. It's funny that yes. you brought that up because Val and I had this exact same conversation while I was watching it. <laughs> exact one. She says, that game that you could never fucking win. Oh, my brother did. Oh, that does not surprise me. No. We would go to like 7-Eleven and um, rather than play it, we would just go over and over again, more him than me, and he would just watch people play it. And by the time he played it, one quarter, he'd have the whole thing memorized and boom, get to the end. Yeah, and that does not surprise me at all. I hated it because I, I could never get the timing right. That was our Dark Souls. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it looked great. Yeah. It did look really good. Yeah, Don Bluth at the time. And uh, ironically, this is uh, another Walt Disney. Walt Disney's been kind of circling us for a little bit. Uh, The Fox acquisition on Miracle on 34th Street has now defaulted that into a Disney thing. And here we are again. This is the second joint productions between Paramount and Walt Disney. Paramount had domestic distribution where Walt Disney had distribution for Dragon Slayer over... I guess the rest of the world. Yes. International through markets. Through Buena Vista. Yeah, through the Buena Vista label. Mm-hmm. And absolutely Buena Vista because it's a PG movie, some brief nudity in there. You do get to see Peter McNichol's uh, swinging ball sack if you look really closely. I didn't. <laughs> and you do get some side boob. Some side boob, yeah. But the worst part, I thought, was and not... And some side butt. And some side butt. But it wasn't even the the nudity, I don't think, was so bad is that one scene where you see somebody's foot get bitten off. That was surprisingly mm. graphic, actually. That's yeah. worse. Yeah. But this movie, did, considering I'd seen it a few times as a kid, I mean, it wasn't like Star Wars repetition, but I'd seen it a handful of times. Ooh, I did not remember a lot of stuff in here. I thought the princess survived. I thought I thought everybody was rescued and dragon went away and everything was golden. It's damn dark. It's it's damn dark. Yeah, yeah. Based on the Saint George legend. Yes, very heavily so. Apparently, yeah. And and uh, Fantasia, the the Sorcerer's Apprentice, yes. was was part of the inspiration for it. I remember seeing this when I, was, I remember the first time I tried to watch it. I didn't make it through because I was just too young. And mm. it was and because it, it's, it's a fairly slow paced movie all in all. Yeah, yeah it's that's, not your standard swords and sorcery. And I think for me, that's one of the reasons why I didn't go back to it as often is because I do remember it being a little slow paced and feeling a little bit bored with it as a kid. But it's I a definitely as an adult definitely holds up much better as a grown up. Yeah. Well, I, I was thinking that it went that one moment when it's he's walking with his his servant through the the forest, and then he he lifts up the pack off his back and stuff is happening, and then he like takes the clothes off. It's like there's that bit of comedic lightness, but still magic. And I thought, oh no, now it's coming alive a little, mm. and then it didn't use that tone 
anywhere else except at the very end for some stupid reason but it was like if it was more magical like that having that tone through it i think would have lightened it a lot and would have made it faster paced yeah for a pg movie it's certainly awfully dark and it does suffer from a bit of an identity crisis because of it and i think that would iron it out because it's a good story Mm -hmm. just to add a little levity to it and be a little less serious into that medieval tone it's almost sometimes leans a little too heavily accurate into that time Mm -hmm. with the religious aspects of, of of the time the heavy catholicism that was with the ruling king and all that and i mean it wasn't so much into like disease pestilence and famine but There's stuff that, like, well, this doesn't have to be in this for a family film. No, part of it is because they set it in the real world. Yeah. It was set immediately after the Romans had left the British Isles, right at the rise of Christianity. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's why it's a lot of that's in there is because they set it in the real world. And, I mean, I don't know if you need to do that, but I think they wanted some of that realism, and that's some, some of that gritty lifestyle that was present at the time. And I get it. I think they were almost too in love with the project and being too accurate. You know, this was the 80s. It was the beginning of the blockbuster. I guess it's a good thing that it was a Paramount Disney joint, so nobody took too much of a loss on this because it did not make money. No, it did not. Nope. With an $18 million budget, it grossed uh, worldwide uh, $14.9 million. So... Almost made its money back, but it's it's not even that big of a budget considering how heavy effects laden this is. It's the first go motion movie, so it's new technology. I mean, it's uh, go motion is a little different from stop motion, where you would take a still, move it slightly, and go again. It's a technology that was developed for Empire for the Adat Walkers, and they did that with this as well what it is is a mechanical mechanism that would move the claw or whatever between the frames as the the camera's rolling so it makes for a much smoother and faster process and it looks far more realistic yeah and you could see when they use the go motion versus the stop motion in the movie they think it was it was quite noticeable Mm -hmm. because some of it looks so smooth and so good even now it still looks good yes and some of it looks okay yeah there's your stop motion yeah there's times where this movie looks remarkably good and i think that's part of why that final battle and the dragons in the sky for most of the time it eases the effects burden yes you just keep them up there yeah (laughs) It's amazing. It amazed me how good it looked. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's still comparable to the dragons you see in Game of Thrones. Yeah, this is 1981, yeah. and in 2019, we still think it holds up. Yeah. Oh yeah, like a lot of stuff with uh, when they did with like the head and the claws and stuff, where mm-hmm. they did it where there's like a weight to it and a heft. It looked really good. Yeah, there's a reason why Vermithrax pejorative is everybody's favorite dragon. It really did inspire Game of Thrones dragons, even stuff Peter. Jackson had done in his Hobbit movies, the looks of the dragons. Vermithrax is pretty much the North American dragon as it is. Um, it was kind of designed based off dinosaurs and then tweaked by Phil Tippett and his crew that came in to do the special effects for the dragon. Yeah, and I can't remember if it was Peter Jackson or Guillermo del Toro who said that the Vermithrax is like the coolest name for a dragon ever. Mm-hmm. And one of the, one of those two mm-hmm. said it, though. So. It is, yes. Yeah. And Vermithrax pejorative means the worm of Thrace, which makes things worse and resides in Trish's throat. It was oddly accurate. Yes, yes. It was oddly accurate. <laughs> Very much so. I don't know how in 1981 they knew Trish would be like ill now. I don't know. But that, is, that was an well, it incredible be, prediction. Alaric was looking into the future like he did all, as always. Yeah. And that's what he saw. I think so, yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. I was going to say one note when we were talking about like the um, accuracy of it. I thought it was really funny because at one point Peter McNichols trying to get the amulet out of like that glass thing and he's being like super careful with all the glass. I'm like, oh, of course he is. As soon as you got an infection in that time, you're a dead maid. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. I was like, that's a nice little note to have in there. Yeah, no, everybody was so good in this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, To be honest, I'm not sure why, but Peter McNichol is very embarrassed by this movie. I don't get why. Well, yeah, he is not a fan of magic. Is part of it. He didn't even want to do this movie because he didn't want to be a magician because he doesn't like magic. Oh, uh, and I just thought, like, hey, given the course of his career, this 
wasn't exactly in his wheelhouse. Yeah. As a yeah. kind of fantasy action hero. I was really surprised when I yeah. realized it was him, to be honest yeah. with you. I'm like, like, this is the only time I've seen him in this kind of role. Maybe he's done voice work where he's done similar characters because he's done lots of voice work because he does have a unique voice. But yeah, I remember when I was really young and going, hey, it's that asshole from Ghostbusters 2. <laughs> you know, and it sounds to me like, like Ghostbusters 2 is also very, that's the only other magical thing I can think of him doing. Yeah. I mean, he was, but it's weird. He was on Ally McBeal and they put a lot of magical realism in that show, mm-hmm. which I, I wonder how he felt about that. Is there any in Veep? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I've never watched it. I like McBeal. Don't hate me. <laughs> Alan McBeal had a dancing baby for a whole bunch of the series. Right. Yeah, but that was also sort of in Allie's head a lot. So. Yeah, but I mean, you're still... There's a lot of this weird magical stuff that's happening, hallucinations yeah, and such. Maybe he got over it. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. But I mean, he had to learn how to ride a horse. He had to learn how to, to get rid of his Texas accent. Right, he did, had to had to learn to do a movie with magic in it. When he's, I don't even think I actually even knew he had a Texas accent. I, didn't I don't either. think I've ever heard his accent in anything I've seen him in. No, and that, because this is sort of his one of his earlier roles, I guess this, this voice training allowed him to sort of come up with a sort of mm-hmm. a non regional accent to his voice. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, a Texas accent is pretty pronounced. It is a little baffling, considering this was all shot in Ireland and the UK, that it wasn't a full UK set of actors. Like, There's quite a few, but I was a little baffled that they brought in Americans, especially ones that had no name to them in the 81. Well, and that's the thing is, I mean, I understand bringing, like, if you want to bring in a big name American star to sort of drive your movie. And that might be part of the reason this movie didn't do as well as it could have, because there's nobody... No stars. There's no stars. Yeah, and... I'm not sure, like, this is Peter McNichol's feature film debut. He'd probably done television or whatever, but I I would think most of his resume before this was stage. I believe it was, yeah. I think this was, like, definitely his first feature film. And it's a lead role. Yeah, so it's a huge and heavy burden for a new actor to come in to lead a big budget fantasy film. And it was up for an Oscar for visual effects. It was up for three, I think. It was one there for the score. Two, there were, I think there were both music, the other yeah, two. Yeah. Original song and score, I do yeah. believe. Uh, it lost the visual effects to the only other nominee that year in 1981, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. It's a tough one to get past. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> I'm like, God damn, if the dragon couldn't do it, nobody could. Well, it's so funny that you have a big dragon in there and there's no melting face like there is in Raiders. And I think they missed an opportunity there. It's like, Absolutely. oh, man, we had the fire, we had the dragon. We just needed to melt somebody's face off. Absolutely. <laughs> melt the face. But melt they the didn't face know. Or two. They didn't know. <laughs> and both were ILM. They were. And it's funny because Raiders doesn't have anywhere near as many effects as Dragon Slayer does. Yeah. Right. So you'd think that just by default, Dragon Slayer, just by the sheer volume of effects, they mm-hmm. should have received the nod. Yeah. Okay, well, we're going to give Trisha's grandmother a breather here while I run the trailer for Dragon Slayer 1981. What you thought was a medieval myth. Is about to become ten tons of rapacious reality. Is safe. No village secure, and no one can save the kingdom except the sorcerer's apprentice, yeah! whose courage is greater than his skill. An apprentice. This is no warrior. Serum sanguinari. Call him what they will. Only he can create a weapon worthy of the name. Dragon Slayer. Edge like no other on this earth. An adventure. Like no other on this earth. Dragon Slayer. Motion picture wizardry that takes you into the Dragon's Lair. The beast. Pray for the hero and see. Dragon 
Slayer. That was Dragon Slayer from 1981, written and directed by Matthew Robbins, also written by Hal Barwood, who wrote MacArthur, Sugarland Express, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He also assisted on that script. Some good pedigree there. For sure, they're good writers. Yeah, absolutely. And starring Peter McNichol, as I said, as Galen, the star of this movie, and the Sorcerer's Apprentice. He was in Ghostbusters 2 as a really annoying little fucker. Well, and you talk about his Texas accent, and I'm like, what was the one he did in Ghostbusters 2? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not even sure what the hell that was. But that's the kind of thing, like, here's this fairly small and soft-spoken type of person. But I think that almost works for this character in somewhat, because he comes across inexperienced, and as he gets his master's crystal, Ulrich's crystal, after he passes, and suddenly this innate power that does lie within him is enhanced a lot. He's yeah. got a lot of bravado, and falsely so. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Which yeah makes it very entertaining, cause, because he relies very heavily on that crystal for his confidence, and when he doesn't yeah. have it, he... He panics. Yeah, so I think it, adding somebody who's not a naturally charismatic lead kind of enhances the role. I mean, you can have charismatic, but if they're not convincingly heroic. Yeah, he's definitely not your standard hero type, and I enjoyed that. I did like that, yeah. Caitlin Clark was Valerian. She uh, shows up posing as a male because the virgins of the their village are being sacrificed well, to the, the dragon. Female virgins. The, the female virgins, yes, are being sacrificed via a lottery to the dragon to appease it to keep it from rampaging. And let's face it, if the dragon's being like, "Hey, here's dinner every few weeks or whatever, yeah. a few months," then he doesn't have to go tearing around hunting for it. He, yeah. They've basically domesticated a dragon. Well, <laughs> basically, or they, they, they're appeasing it. Yeah. Appeasing it and giving it a, a feeding habit. It's like my neighbor who feeds the fucking squirrels. Yeah. <laughs> and they just keep waiting for it. Well, I just kept thinking, like, it's like, oh, yeah, we have to sacrifice a virgin because that's just what we do. I'm like, going, will the dragon really know? Yeah, will the dragon know? Does Can they it taste care? it? Yeah. It's food. That's yeah. all they care about. Yeah. yeah. Well, I do like the fact that they specifically mentioned the fact that it was the female virgins that they were sacrificing. Because we brought this up in Monster Squad where we were talking yeah. about why does it always have to be a girl? Mm -hmm. Right, because boys can be virgins too. Right, at least they made nod to it, or they they mentioned yeah. the fact that it, they're specifically going after the girl children. Yeah, I'm just guessing uh, men are gamier. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I think in this society, have, women are somewhat disposable. Right? Well, yeah, and that's I mean, like, what it comes down to. Why don't you just yeah sacrifice some men? You might even need less men. They might have more meat on them. Yeah, it is medieval times. You're ruled by a monarch, a king, in this society anyway, uh -huh. and also those who are rich enough can buy their way out of the lottery. Absolutely. And he's been keeping his daughter out of the lottery without her knowledge. She thinks she's been in there this whole time. Okay. Um, Ralph Richardson was Ulrich, the elderly sorcerer at the beginning and the end of the film, and he was in uh, Time Bandits and another episode we recorded a few years ago, episode 125. He was in Rollerball. He was in Rollerball. Yeah. I love him. I think he's wonderful. I thought he was very good, too. John Hallam was Tyrion. He was basically the closest thing we had to a villain. The king shows up fairly late in the movie. And he is basically motivated by protecting his kingdom and selfishly trying to protect his daughter. And let's face it, there is a certain economics to this as well by ruling by fear but i think it's more Tyrion than anybody else he sees this as the only way to protect the society and uh, it's working so Tyrion doesn't want that change the king he doesn't want to provoke the dragon yeah the king doesn't would love to get rid of the dragon but to do it and fail causes reprisals and you get the feeling that it's not that they haven't tried and then when here comes this kid who does try and yes there are reprisals well, <laughs> and it's bad he talks about his brother and his brother like did try and mm -hmm. then disappear forever you actually understand why he's doing what he's doing yeah, his motivations are pretty clear and there's actually like, this line where he says well yes i serve i serve my king but i serve the kingdom first yeah, it's those people nattering in his ear, his captain of the guard, which is Tyrion, and the religious aspects within his kingdom as well is also nattering in his ear. So, I mean, maybe there was another way, but you're 
drawn by myth and legends and well this worked on the volcano <laughs> well, it is, it's so funny where they sit there it's one of those stupid things where they're like well we've done this so long and it seems to be working it's so we'll never figure out another th- way to do shit yeah it's it it's a traditional thing and they just had no other way and i mean it, even Ulrich says this is pretty barbaric and but the thing is it worked it worked yeah uh, John Hallam uh, was Tyrion, and he was in quite a few things we've actually talked about, and none of it I remember. <laughs> episode 67. Santa Claus the movie. Very seasonal for us. Uh, episode 29. I wasn't here for this one, but it was Flash Gordon. It was. And episode 188. Wicker Man, one of our favorites. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Jeff Omega's favorite for sure. Peter Eyre was uh, Cassidorus Rex, and I think I've seen that in a textbook somewhere. <laughs> Me. <laughs> Discovered somewhere in British Columbia, the skeleton resembles yeah. this guy, <laughs> who was in a movie called From Hell. Nice. Yeah. I is that really, the Johnny Depp one? That is the Johnny Depp one. Oh. I really like that one. Albert Salmi was Grail. He was in another movie where they had a problem with another thing and uh, that thing was a gopher in caddyshack is that what he was from he was in caddyshack yeah that was the, probably the biggest name one i had in there and it worked into kind of a joke so uh, i've um, seen him and his face was really familiar He'd yeah been a lot of stuff yeah sydney bromley was hodge i guess he would have been like the guy who cleaned up after the wizards and he was funny. Yeah, he was in American Werewolf in London. He was in a movie called uh, Jabberwocky, which is episode... 88. That uh, we remade that movie as well. I think it was just me and Trish on that it one. It was just you yeah. and Trish. I missed yeah. out on that one. Yeah, you certainly did. And we had a good time. Chloe Salaman was Princess Elspeth. And she was in Winston Churchill and The Wilderness. Emerus James was Valerian's father. And he was in The Scarlet and The Black on television in the UK. He was mainly a UK TV star. Uh, Roger Kemp was Horse Rick, and he was in Superman 2 and Pink Floyd The Wall. Yeah, and I think everybody's going to recognize this name. Very small part, but he was one of the church leaders. He was uh, Brother Jacobus in this movie, Ian McDiarmid, who uh, we covered in a couple episodes, episode 23 and 123. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels and Empire Strikes Back, and... Oh, I forgot about a Dirty Rotten Scoundrel. Yeah, that was episode 13. 13. And oh, then, what the fuck? 13, 23, and 123? Pretty creepy. Yeah. Right. And then episode 13 was Force Awakens and Star Wars, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. Last Jedi and uh, Empire Strikes Back. So we've talked about them a bunch of times, because uh, and the Emperor Palpatine seems to like 1, 3, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm not sure what's going on there, but uh, I think we're discovering a pattern to the Empire. We are starting to discover a pattern to the Empire. So will 223 be our Star Wars episode? Star Wars episode? Because the timing could be just about right. I know. As of this recording, it hasn't opened yet, but by the time you hear it, it will be. Yeah. <laughs> and that's three episodes. I think it opens this Friday. Hmm. That, that after we record, yes, the 19th. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just to destroy the magic of this recording. <laughs> we might have to try and plan that. Well, let's get into uh, this movie a little bit. Basically, this group has come from their village to seek a wizard. Not that they haven't tried a few others, but they're all dead. Which is rather funny. You'll hear that clip in two pieces. the That uh, part where they talk about the other uh, wizards they've done. Hey, what about this guy? I don't really want to do this. Do you want to go with that guy? Uh, we opened with that clip and um, closing with kind of what preceded that clip. Because I really like the Elric bits. <laughs> yes. He was... Very, very entertaining. For a guy who wasn't in the movie very much, uh, he stole his scenes, yeah. yeah. Elderly thespians, there's a reason why they're awesome. Yes. Mm-hmm. Especially in roles like this, because they can yeah. just sort of like really lean into it. It's almost like you have to, if you're a UK actor who's uh, now in his 60s or older, you have to play a wizard. At some point in your career, you have to play a wizard. If, if you don't, what what are you doing? Yeah, what, what have you done with your life? Exactly. You yeah, have yeah. to either play Scrooge or a wizard. That's really all you've got. Yeah. Those are the career cappers. They are. So um, Everybody thinks it's Hamlet and it's not. No. It's, it's a wizard. Wizard or Scrooge, yeah. You're right. You're absolutely mm-hmm. right. 
<laughs> and it it applies to my casting too. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Funny how that works. <laughs> so they've gone seeking Ulrich. Ulrich really can't make this trip. It's too far away for him, and it would probably kill him just to walk there. Yeah, and he's he's having trouble walking. Like they, they make that very clear at the beginning of the movie that he has mobility issues. Yeah, no, he's definitely a senior years, and he's putting on airs. For the audience, really, to make him look more powerful than he actually is. This group has been tracked by Tyrion, who I think that's just kind of what he does. Like, I'm not sure what he does for the king, but clearly, if there's any sort of insurrection, I think that's what he's there for. And if it disturbs the norm, and in this case, sacrificing virgins to the dragon to keep it from burning the kingdom... He's going to stop well, it. He's said he's, as much. He's in the medieval movie. Gestapo. Yeah, I mean, he thinks he's doing the right thing, and he actually comes off friendly enough a little bit at the no. beginning. Well, he doesn't come across as evil so much as single-minded. Yeah. Oh, really? I just thought, like, yeah, he's not so much evil. He's just a bit of a dick. He is definitely a dick. Yeah. Yeah, I have a job, but I'm going to do it no matter what. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't sound like the king gave him that job, so I'm not sure what's going on. It yeah. almost sounds like it's, an, it's a role that he had prior to king casadorius it's possible yeah. and that could play into our remake like i feel like his motivations aren't fully formed like i do get it but they don't feel like fully formed well i mean if we lean into the idea that we're he did mention other people have tried like if there was some backstory where he's like i was part of a group that tried to take on this dragon and terrible things happened i could totally get why he would be dedicated to just having it like this and that's yeah, that's a maybe a good way of sort of doing it is that he was he went with the king on his quest to defeat the dragon and was the only survivor of the party. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Just, really simple. Yeah. King's brother, he went missing and his brother takes the throne. Yeah. His simple. weaker minded brother, yes. Yeah. So he little, has no respect yeah. for the king either. It doesn't really come across that he does in yeah. this film. So exactly. it actually it? does make him a little more fully formed just by saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The king is very much like, all right, well, we'll keep with this tradition because it seems to be working. Really, if you've got a citizenry that's under fear, they're easily controlled. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. I love that opening scene, right? Mm -hmm. Her terror and and how graphic it was. It really Mm -hmm. captured the beginning of the movie really, really well. And I know I just went off the rails there because we were talking about sort of a citizenry under fear, but I think it does sort of because her fear is really a great example of of how the citizenry would be affected. Right? Yeah, Yeah. I mean, Valerian's gone through great lengths to make herself look like a boy. Yes. Mm -hmm. So she wouldn't be part of the lottery. Her family has gone through great lengths to hide her. Exactly, because, yeah, the five years of being free of taxes is nowhere near recompense for losing a child. And that's where I was going at the beginning of the thing, is that part where they award them five years free of obligations to the king. It's small recompense, but that's a huge sacrifice you're making to protect the people. And that is a very hungry dragon. That is a, it's a huge freaking well, dragon, and I don't think getting fed every six months is going to keep it going. Yeah, well, I mean, aren't you supposed to, like, snakes and lizards, it's like a mouse every few months. Yeah. But, I mean, what I kind of hated about this whole thing is they're they're like, oh, no, we keep it fed. And then... There's babies, so it's like, no, you've just fucked yourself up because you get fed it long enough, it's going to have babies. <laughs> like, you guys well, fucked up. Th- well, that's not how normal procreation works, No, right? it doesn't, so, but it's a magical creature. Exactly. It's also a dragon. Yeah. Dragons don't exist, so there you go. <laughs> well, I mean, the first thing I would have thought of if we were fighting this dragon and found babies, fuck, where's the male? Yeah. Yeah. I, exactly. I thought there was two dragons at one point. I don't know. I got mm. confused at a certain point at the end. Well, what if there was? Maybe one was out hunting, and generally with a lot of species, at least mammalian ones, which I'm not sure how it applies to, because dragons would kind of be that bridge between birds and, and lizards, which already exists within dinosaurs. So, yeah. But with at least mammalian, the females are usually the hunters, mm-hmm. like the lions and the yeah. tigers. And bears, oh my. So what if something like that, like it's out hunting for the babies and the male is protecting the lair? Yeah. Oh, actually, like you know what? That, that can work really well. We could actually have, instead of having the big cave-in and stuff like that, yeah. you could have Galen kill the male thinking he's killed the only dragon. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And the end battle can be the actual battle with Fermatax. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it that's... clearly didn't collapse the layer because the lake of fire is still in there. The yeah. babies are still protected. So the male did its job in protecting it, but got crushed in the process or, mm-hmm. or was defeated through whatever we decide. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I, I like that idea. I like it a lot. And I think one of the things that we can add to is the, the sacrifice is only every six months, mm-hmm. right? But every month they deliver three or four sheep as well. Right. Yeah, I think the ceremony would be a lot bigger. It is Ireland. There'd probably be less Christians and more paganism going on here. Well, isn't yeah, Druidism and stuff like that. Yeah, is supposed to be Wales or no? Well, it was filmed in parts of Wales. In parts of it were filmed in Wales and Ireland and and all. Yeah, Wales is very dragonish, but that's that what that Ian McDermott character is. Is he's that like Christian Welsh guy work, who yeah. comes in that missionary who's trying to convert people. Mm-hmm. That would be an interesting uh, bit, too, where you have a society already under fear of the dragon and turning to religions, and you have these two sects, the old Druidism ways, that's already familiar with this, and more familiar with mysticism, whereas Catholicism is more about faith. And you could have this in the village. I kind of wanted to do away with it, but now I'm kind of liking the, the, the combative aspects yeah, of that. The, yeah, the juxtaposition of it. And it also plays really well into there's that bit of dialogue in the, in, in, in the end. I believe it's Tyrion who delivers the line about, about how magic is going away. Mm-hmm. And it's it just a matter of time before the dragon's we just magic. we have to so, wait it out. Yeah. yeah, we have to wait it out. And I think that plays really well into that juxtaposition as well. Yeah. Is, he's, and it does kind of play to the beginning where the wizard's saying, hey, I, I used to know a wizard who could turn lead into gold, and boy, would have that been a score for you once I passed. But sadly, I never learned that trick. Yeah. So maybe there's some truth to that, that well, the magic's going away. And they, they reference all, the, all those, those wizards who are no longer around, mm-hmm. right? So he's like the last wizard. So yeah, the, the sort of the fading of magic is a good sort of undertone to the whole movie, and, and with Galen being the last voice of it. And I was thinking too, like when they talk about like the sacrificing of the virgins, I had like the idea where it's like my apprentice was actually like a virgin female. They were just sacrificing the people that were going to help save them. But that might be part of the point is like the dragon wasn't really eating the sacrifices. It was trying to eat the magic. Yeah. There's mm-hmm. a, there's to a stay they, alive. Have, have like a magic to to the virgin sacrifice. I kind of like that. Thanks. It's not it's not about the food. It's about the magic. Well, inherent. I think it's because it's going it's away. The magic inherent within the ritual itself yeah. and the innocence. And, and the the, innocence. that's probably why they use virgins. Is they're a pure vessel for that. Yeah. And there's there's also like they're virgins, but they have that power of life in them that mm-hmm. could be as kind of a source of magic. Like that outcropping outside of his cave. Like I would probably want some actual room or something there like uh, one of those circle of stones that's very uh, druidic and druidic yeah, yeah. the stone hand type thing yeah so it does look like more of an altar for this half worker man and half medieval sacrifice yeah i like that make it more more symbolic right because yeah. i was in, in the original is just a post with manacles with a, with a hook for the manacles yeah it feels like a little too s- simple for something so important I agree, and that was part of it too. And I mean, realistically, that pole was so scarred up that anybody could have mm-hmm. easily just sort of scooted up and got the manacles off the hook. Yeah, well, I, mean, I thought she was going to like reach up and put her legs around. Yeah, and, that's whoop. yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that's very. Uh, what was that? That second Star Wars movie, Episode Two, where Padme does that, or John Voight and Anaconda. There you go. <laughs> yeah, and I was kind of expect like that's what I'm going. Well, you could just do this. Like yeah. watching it, I found that a little bit frustrating. Even though I liked the yeah. effect of the shot, there's more pomp and circumstance when they sacrifice to King Kong. Yeah, mm-hmm. so like it feels like that sh- there should be more of that there. I think it does add gravitas to that scene. Yeah, and I'd like to have it be like a druidic ceremony initially. Mm-hmm. So that we were talking about the laws of nature and and giving back to the creatures of the, of the earth and and feeding the magic that's so important to mm-hmm. their faith. And then that gives you, again, back to that juxtaposition where we have the moment where the Catholic priest comes and is woefully unsuccessful. Yeah, and maybe he should be part of that initial party that goes looking for the wizard. And he's so like, this is really desperate, guys. This, this doesn't exist. This is putting your faith in the wrong gods. Yeah, especially after 
Ulrich sacrifices himself. Yeah. Going, you can't harm me. And then dies. But. Yeah. It's funny because he could have just like, hey, stab me with your sword. No, but you got to go get this knife from this room, from this chest. It was very specific. It's like, and oh, he's doing something. And he, this does feel like Obi-Wan going, hey, strike me down because I can't make this trip. Well, and there are a lot of comparisons in the reviews about this movie comparing it to the original Star Wars where they felt like Galen was kind of the Luke Skywalker character in that sort mm. of naive, slightly goofy way. That moment there, as you mentioned, another great parallel to Star Wars. So there, there are some parallels there for sure. Mm. But when you're making a movie between 1977 and about 1987... And your biggest success is Star Wars? There's, you're probably going to want to look like that. Yeah, you're, yeah, and you're, you're probably going to want to steal something. You're going to borrow and, and, and certainly take inspiration from the thing that worked. Yeah, because everybody wanted to be Star Wars, and there was some mild fantasy successes with Conan. Uh, there were a lot of fantasy films being made, and then Star Wars having that wonderful mix of both. And, well, okay, if we take less science fiction, but can borrow some of that and throw it in here. I mean, it is a good formula for success. It is. I, I mean, the mentor-student relationship is always been a successful device in story always so i mean it's a fair comparison but at the same time it's not the first time it's been done and it won't be the last no of course not i think we got at least some of like what's going on in society is is kind of feeling right to me now yeah filling it out a little bit i still love the device where privilege is paramount mm-hmm. where they're, they're keeping their the i think that's classic it feels almost shakespearean to me it, it it does and it's it's also timely i mean you talk about we talk about privilege mm-hmm. a lot nowadays oh yeah and, this film would work really well right now because it's something that plays to modern politics and modern society just in general yeah how privilege really works yeah right it's not just having money and, and better things it's the protection of privilege mm-hmm. as well you know you can avoid cause and effect and penalties and, and risks this one does a really great job of handling that yeah and so if you think of that in a time of reaganism and redo that now in a Trump world, then yeah, that's a big deal. It, it is. I, I think it's a, a really big deal. And I, I love uh, Princess Elspeth's reaction to it. It's like, what? Wait a minute. I, I wasn't included all this time I thought I was. And she does the right thing to the point of making sure that she's the only person who can be chosen, mm-hmm. which I loved. I loved the, that whole scene, the terror on her father's face when he realizes that her name has been called and then his trying to manipulate the situation, very Trump-like. Yeah. Right? This is fake news. <laughs> <laughs> and then he redraws, and it's her name again. So, yeah, her sacrifice, and then her saying, no, this is true because I put my name in because I found out that I wasn't included in, the, in any of the draws at all. So now I'm the only person in the draw. And I love that. I think that was great. I thought that was a great device. I think it still works. And, you know, far as the main structure of this movie, I don't want to change too much of it because you've got the classic hero's journey. You've got that theme of privilege that still resonates today and more so than ever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think her making the sacrifice was really important. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she had to sacrifice her entire life. No, she strung up. And there's this weird little thing that doesn't really go anywhere where Valerian, she does reveal her identity after she thinks the dragon's been thwarted. So Galen was already aware, having uh, gone into the lake when she was bathing. Thinking she was still a boy, yeah. Still, yeah, it's like, well, you got nothing I haven't seen. And so he's diving, and he's like, oh, or maybe I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that brief is... moment of, holy shit, you don't have a penis. <laughs> yes, it was, it was actually quite funny. <laughs> and you have a, quite a striking form. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, I love that. I love that little love story. Mm. I mean, it feels but, kind of abrupt. But the princess comes in so late, and then Valerian have these jealous thoughts. It's like, okay, she's starting to have feelings for Galen, who's actually showing his bravery, sometimes falsely so, and foolishly so. But she is falling for him, and Galen as well is falling for her. But she gets it in her head that he is falling for the princess, who has really not spent a whole lot of time with, other than when he was locked in the dungeon. Which makes sense, is... It is- that she misunderstands his intent because he's met her and she's beautiful and she's the princess, right? Mm-hmm. So in her head, why wouldn't he fall in love with her? Not making if the not rational the- decisions going, hey, I hardly, he hardly knows her. Well, I would think there's a, a bit of a resentment as well, like, and maybe we can play this into our remake, is, okay, he's gone to the king at the king's request 
and he's been there for a little while. Well, whatever these villagers could offer him, the king can offer him more. And now there's a point of, hey, well, what if he's under the thumb of the king now, who hasn't really had our best interests in mind? I think that that could work. I was just thinking that another... Because she's already hiding herself she is, from yeah. the laws of the kingdom. So she would be justifiably a little worried about this. And hey... The penalties this, for her as well. Yeah. And if this guy's the heroes of the kingdom being showered with riches and and the king's daughter... Like, who wouldn't turn that down, at least in her mind, as a villager, a poor yeah. villager? Not realizing that he's actually imprisoned because they don't think what he's done is the right thing. Another thing I'd like to add is that there could be this whole subculture in the society where they're deliberately soiling their daughters. Oh, yeah. Right, to there protect was, them. There is at one point, because you now she stands revealed to the entire village, and we are to understand that women are being sacrificed virgin women i thought at one point they were just going to get down it's like well we can solve this problem right now yeah <laughs> and i'd like to address that because it would happen it would, it would absolutely time. fucking happen absolutely it would happen yeah. it's like oh you want virgins oh no no she's she's definitely not a virgin <laughs> yeah her brother check, took check her. with uh, us every four weeks <laughs> i think that that's another subtext that needs to be there is that is this subculture where, where villagers would be doing everything they can to protect their daughters. Yeah. Aside from protecting their boys, there's an easy solution to it. Yeah, it's like, hey, Bob, yeah, sorry about what I did to your lawn the other day, but uh, can you do me a favor and uh, go fuck my daughter? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I don't want her in the lottery. That's a lottery I don't want to win. Yeah, I'll promise you my son's hand in marriage to your daughter if... Or I'll promise my daughter to you. You can have my finest sheep. Yeah. And and your son can marry my daughter when they're of age yeah. if he takes her now. Right? Like there could be all kinds of, of things like that where they're making these agreements to, to protect their children. Yeah. It's like, hey, do you want a sword? I because that guy was uh, Valerian's father was a metalsmith. So was a blacksmith, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, that brings us to the magic spear. It was just I, a fucking spear. <laughs> it was that they made magic. Yeah. Right. And which and Did I they... like... <laughs> well, or is there just a belief? I felt like there was an unjustified belief. <laughs> well, I mean, you had the glowing spear, but... Uh, oh, okay. I guess it did glow at times. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, but the scene where they made it a magic spear, it's already super sharp. Yeah. And then he reforges it even to make it even sharper. It's the sharpest spear in the world. Uh, How do you know that? You've never gotten outside your village. <laughs> yes. I think that he should be able to imbue it with a magic power. I think that, it, especially if we're going... I don't know if he should, because he's very inexperienced. I mean, he's learned spells and stuff, but we didn't really see him do anything until he found his master's crystal. Yes, of course. Right? And and I'm not saying that... And even then, he sometimes couldn't perform. Like, when he was in front of the king, I'm like, oh, if there is not an impotence thing I, there, I don't know where you would put that. <laughs> there is, I, but I still think it's important in the story. Now, whether it's, it's actually successfully, like, it's, it's magic enough to do the job mm -hmm. is another question entirely. Yeah. Right? But if we're going to have him kill the male of the pair, then having it magically imbued makes sense. That's why I think, like, I still like the fact that he kind of accidentally brought the mountain down rather than do battle and so there's this false bravado it's like oh that wasn't that hard <laughs> exactly <laughs> this this uh, false ego of it all not having directly having to face the dragon i mean he was pretty ballsy just to walk in yes yeah and so is valerian when she goes in there and yeah. grab the scales and stuff like that yeah uh, that's uh, i mean she's in there and she she's the one who discovers that there's there's baby dragons mm -hmm. and she's almost eaten by one so yeah i think that that's a good point i think that we can make better use of the time that he's imprisoned for him to find his own sort of path mm -hmm. so that the ability that he shows later makes more sense yeah because he's been stripped of that crystal by the king who clearly has seen this crutch that he's using and even if it's failing galen at the time does see that this is an important thing and that's probably what happened here is like well i'll divest you of this magic and take it for myself but if during that time of self-reflection in jail that's a good time where we can see him find his own magic and he should be able to free himself yeah and, through that yeah and understanding that that the, the jewel itself is just a focus yeah 
I think that that's somewhere in there. We need to work that in somehow Mm -hmm. where he's trying to figure out a way to escape from the the prison. Well, inherently, I think it's holding Ulrich's magic and being within the crystal and really the ashes are just the remnants of his form that are reformed within the lake of fire so really a lot of this isn't coming from galen it's coming from ulrich yes. ulrich's been doing this magic this whole time which is like well you don't have to be a dancing monkey for the king which is why it doesn't work yeah yeah and exactly why it doesn't work because all because ulrich would have never done that yeah no, that is, there's something to that too as well. And yeah, even the magic for the, of the spear could be sort of Ulrich working through Galen. Mm-hmm. And that, that you could have some fun with Galen getting confused as to why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Right? Because he's not changing the way he's doing things. Yeah, I like that. And that could be part of his realization when he's looking into the rim yeah. of the lake of fire. And maybe during those visions when he's looking in other streams of water, because we see that these wizards can see into the future and make predictions through liquids and maybe through because we never see galen do it until he has the crystal either so when he starts seeing these visions i think Ulrich should be in those visions too so here's this hint it's like hey he's here he's he's been here this whole time yeah no i i think that makes more sense because it's kind of doesn't when he sees the the sort of sees the, the reflection of the fire in the water then it, it all sort of comes together in one flashbang moment oh mm-hmm. it makes all sense now and then he runs back to the cave to to do what he has to do mm-hmm. and i want to talk about that too because that's sort of the moment there that really pissed me off <laughs> oh i I'm, I'm not so keen on the whole suicide bomber thing either <laughs> <laughs> that too i like the idea of sort of him getting little hints throughout the whole movie as to what's going on mm-hmm. right give the audience a chance to sort of see what's going yeah, on and figure it, out what's it, happening exactly the audience gets those puzzle pieces it's not just for galen it's for the audience as well it's like okay this guy was important and died really early oh no he's he's coming back yeah i would like to change it a little bit though because i mean you set up galen as the hero all the way through it mm-hmm. and then in the end it's ulrich who's the hero he's the one who makes the, the hero sacrifice well, hey, that crystal didn't destroy itself. Exactly. Right? <laughs> but you, you see what I'm making is like, well, the point I'm making, though, is like, okay, well, here you go. You're, you get to be a hero and you get to break a crystal. Yeah, you get to drop a rock. Yeah, so it's 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 kind of anticlimactic a little bit where our hero isn't really the hero. Mm-hmm. Well, he did kill a bunch of babies. Yeah. I mean, dragon babies. Let me be clear. Dragon babies. <laughs> That's, yeah. So And, and, and he, maybe he, a baby Yoda. Yeah, and, just a, just a really piss off our audience, <laughs> off screen. And yeah, and then I mean, he does fight the dragon unsuccessfully, right? So certainly by changing that dynamic a little bit, with him actually successfully killing one of the dragons, thinking he's killed. Yeah. Well, part of the hero's journey is that road of failure and then eventually to success, but we don't technically see that. No, we never do see the, the hero that the village sought. Really, was the hero in the end, which was Ulrich. It wasn't Galen. It was exactly, right? but your, your story follows Galen, right? yeah. so you ne- you never get that moment yeah. with Galen. He's a mule. Yeah, he's he's a device that that Ulrich used. Killing Ulrich's pendant in the magic is what destroys the dragon, like not the explosion. Like maybe the dragon just shrivels up by that lack of magic, mm-hmm. and like some of the residual ones actually goes into Galen at the end. So he kind of sort of wins, but he doesn't. Hmm. But I mean, like, I mean, they talk about the magic is what the dragon should die when there's no magic. So I thought that's actually what was supposed to happen when he destroyed the pendant was the lack of magic is what killed the dragon, mm. not an explosion. Not this explosive expulsion. I, well, I got the feeling it was it was the magic expelling from Ulrich in a very explosive way, which yeah. caused all that chaos and should have rained a whole lot of gore on that village. <laughs> yeah, because it was really gory when it, la- when it finally landed. Yeah. I like what Trish did yeah. there, though. I, I actually did, where, where the destruction of the Pendant. crystal, yeah, crystal. Um, is what ultimately leads to, to the dragon's death. And it doesn't have to be Ulrich. Mm-hmm. You know what? Maybe Ulrich never um, reforms in a, in a body. You have that Empire Strikes Back moment where he appears on the Lake of Fire to give Galen a message, right? Where he gives Galen the instruction. He says... You need to do something with the crystal. You'll know when to do it, right? Just like he does in the movie. But instead of having this battle with the lightning and all that stuff with Ulrich. I had this thought. What if he could put the crystal on any kind of, let's say, um, not conscious being, like an animal or a dead person, and then Ulrich can speak through it physically? It'd be fun on film. It would be fun on film. 
Hmm. <laughs> I, I don't. What if? What if? What if uh, nothing intelligent. So what if the king wears it and suddenly Ulrich is speaking? <laughs> What does that say about our king? <laughs> that could lead to a funny moment right after he takes it from Galen, actually. Yeah. But he's got to figure out how that works in the first place. And, like, I've been worried this whole time. I haven't heard anything. <laughs> that could add some levity to it. Yeah. I like that, actually. Only the weak minded. If you're going to steal from Star Wars, go full Star Wars. <laughs> it's, it's the Force thing. Or have it through, like, a horse. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of that horse gag at the end, it's just Ulrich being like, hey, guys. Oh, yeah. He's got the wishes for a horse and horse appears. <laughs> yeah. That's that, not that magic. Was, that that's was, just wishing. Yeah, and that was just a little cheesy. A little too cheesy for my liking. Well, yes. yeah, it, it, it was a way of showing that, that there was still magic. We could do something better than that. But, yeah, I think that given the, how anticlimactic the whole ending was, mm-hmm. that needs a little bit of work to begin with. Yeah. Right. 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 From the moment where we, if we keep it with the burning lake of fire and and the the appearance of Ulrich, right. And you know what? We could do. We, I like your uh, your idea there, but Galen never gets anything that makes sense out of out of Ulrich when he does it. That's true. Right. <laughs> right? right. It isn't until and then you can sort of tie in the lake of fire. So it's like Ulrich trying to guide him to the lake. Yeah. And it's not until he pours the ashes in the lake where he can actually. Maybe get just him. old people at that time. Hodge wasn't any clearer either. He got shot by an arrow and he was. Talking fairly normal. (laughs) They may have shot my body, but there's nothing wrong with my mouth. (laughs) And clearly not, because you didn't even sound like you were in pain. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, I think you could have some fun moments there where where he keeps trying different things to try and get a coherent message out of out of Ulrich. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe it's those times where maybe he's got it wrapped around his hand and he's holding Hodge as he's passing away. And that's where we get little hints that, oh, that wasn't Hodge talking. That was Ulrich talking. Yeah. Or he's holding it in his hand. He rests his hand on his horse and his horse goes, so he hears his voice in his head saying, go away. It's not time yet. Right. Like just little things like that where, where he's like, no, mm. not yet. Yeah. Let's not make it super cheesy. Yeah. But yeah, and, I kind of dig that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And then you could have that moment with the king is like, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> well, these are much nicer than my other robes. Yes. <laughs> I thought I was old. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there could be a little more levity in there. Because I feel like there, this movie it takes itself a little too seriously. And it uh, almost undermines the action. You need that those things of, to break the darkness up a little hey, bit. Like when he's trying to make that lead into gold. And he's like, he's Ulrich grabs the pendant from him, and he's like, "That's not how you do it, dumbass." <laughs> I, there's a great line where it's, "I can turn your gold into lead." Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, that's what he should do. <laughs> I liked that. I thought that was a great play on on the whole alchemy myth. Yeah, I liked it too. Yeah, no, I oh, think we have a, a good sort of framework. I mean, we're not changing the story much. We're just sort of adding and Yeah, because it, it works. It's yeah. very classic in that regard. And there's a reason why it's rated so well, despite it being a failure. IMDb rates it a 6.7 out of 10. And uh, Rotten Tomatoes, the critic score is like 87%. Uh, audience score is uh, 62%, which is probably feels a little more accurate. It's a strong film, but, I mean, still has its faults. It, it certainly does, yeah. There's, yeah. Some, there's some bad dialogue log and there's a f- some some moments that don't quite hit in the movie so yeah mm-hmm. i'd say 62 to 65 percent is pretty reasonable actually yeah yeah i mean there's some dubious talents in there and then you got really great talents who are in really minor roles yes like ian mcdermott so. yeah but this was i mean well he still would have been in his 40s i mean he, he, he looked pretty fresh-faced yeah, he did i almost yeah. didn't recognize him yeah. yeah yeah i'm like good god i always felt like you've always looked old yeah <laughs> Yeah, there are some actors who just do. <laughs> All right, well, let's get into our casting here, um, unless you have some other ideas. Well, I wanted to maybe do a little bit more with the ending, and then I think we're I, I'm kind of okay. happy with it, because we, we, if we're changing... I mean, we, we've got now the advantage of motion capture rather than go motion, yeah. um, so... All that battle stuff can be far more dynamic, and we can have, like, aerial strikes and and then landing on the ground a little combat there and then i mean the dragon's always going to have the advantage of the fire and high ground so yeah it is one thing i'd like to do is like we've already sort of discussed that he kills her mate and so he i'd say he still has the spear 
and you can use that as a device mm-hmm. in the end battle where it, where you have that moment where it breaks. Mm-hmm. I think we can steal a little bit from the Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, where he has this village that's been under this fear this whole time. It's like, well, I need your help. I can't do this alone. Yeah. You came to my master, and I don't have him here yet. Because this dragon, there has been some of that. The, the shield with, that's made out of the scales, really cool. Yes. That was a really neat idea. But there's the advantage of high ground and stuff. So what if you weaken some of these natural perches around the town? So when it does come to strike, that whole ground just, just collapses on them. I like that where yeah. they, where they don't get, have to get involved directly in the combat, but they can yeah. help him prepare for this final battle. Yeah, I like that a lot, actually. Yeah, um, and you'd think the kingdom would be able to defend itself from. Oh, well, if they've been under the thumb this whole time, they might not have much left. But I mean, you'd think there'd be catapults and things like that. But a lot of that's probably been destroyed over time by this dragon. Probably, and I just had an idea. You can poo poo it if you want, but I just had an idea. So there's that moments. It's a very distinctive moment where Valerian's father gives her the cross. Mm. What if the climactic moment is he realizes that putting the cross and the stone together... This union is, of faiths that we keep talking about? Yes. That, that collision of the faiths is what, in the end, kills all the magic in the area. Mm. Well, it's kind of a good message of uniting. You don't have to have this yeah. animosity between faiths. Yeah, there's this, so yeah, there's these, these two symbols of, of faith come together and create something brand new and it can be cheesy like the keep where this beam of light comes up and destroys the dragon or it could just be all of a sudden there's a pulse and the dragon falls to the ground right mm-hmm. because there's the magic's gone right and it could be something as simple as that the fine details i'm not worried about but i just mm-hmm. like i like the idea of those two faces coming well together. and maybe that that's what finally empowers maybe we don't break that spear at all finally empowers that spear that's been handmade for this task and Wrap the stone around it, wrap that cross yeah. around it, and away you go. Pierce that fiery chest of his that's just full of explosive energy. Bam. Yeah, I'm liking that. that just, as soon as we started talking about it, I started saying it. I'm like, oh, that's going to work. Yeah, mm-hmm. that totally works for me. It makes Galen the hero, yeah. but he still he still has that mentor-student relationship yeah, with, with the Lake of Fire. A lot of this is coming through the message of, of Ulrich, who's still with him in a way. Yes. And that was the only way he could be here is to guide somebody else to do this yeah. rather than be a suicide bomber which i was not cool with oh. yeah. like you died twice <laughs> yeah. yeah oh yeah no it, it, in it, just as many minutes like you were around for like 10 minutes yeah. at the beginning and 10 minutes at the end yeah. maybe i i want to keep the one moment though where the king comes by and he just puts his sword on the already dead dragon and they're like he's a dragon slayer yeah <laughs> yeah well he says to himself all hail Casadorius rex slayer yeah. of dragons like yeah. i want to keep that really bum note because it's like yeah of course a big foolish fool would think that's a good idea yeah. <laughs> and he'd look even more foolish as if, if we sort of play up how yeah, and you can so see Donald Trump doing something stupid yes like that. I'm the yeah, taking credit for his work I did, fucking it. I did that take a picture or put my head on Thanos because that was a good idea uh. Sorry for Americans, we don't want to try to bring politics in it, but goddamn, he makes it hard. <laughs> we can only do so much. It's not like the UK did much better a couple weeks True, ago. Oh yeah. Good lord. <laughs> There's only so much we can ignore. Sometimes you bring that as allegories into film, and it certainly works with this one. It well, certainly I does, mean, yeah. As we've discussed before, horror itself, the themes in that generally reflect the times that people are living in. Yeah. And fantasy can do the same thing. Yes. Yeah. So, and, and there's one other thing. Trish gave me a little note there. Actually, there's a couple little notes there that I. I yeah, I, when she doesn't feel like she can talk, she hands over her pad. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so I want to mention those because uh, I want to talk about Elspeth's sacrifice a little bit more too. Okay. Because, yeah. because we didn't kind of touch. Base I thought on that. that that was really startling when you know she she does give in. She's rigged the lottery with that every tile has her name on it, and they string her up. She's like, no, no, I'm doing this. She's willing to make the sacrifice for the people because, like, she knows what her dad's been doing is wrong, keeping her out of the lottery. And even when she's able, when Galen frees her, she walks directly into the cave. She is resigned to this. Yeah, and I like that part but of it. I was shocked when the babies were eating her. Yeah. And she's like, holy shit, she's dead already. Yeah. I still want that moment, but she's not dead. He does save her, but she does lose the foot. Oh, yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I think... Uh, 
Yeah. She survives. Yeah, she survives, but she's damaged. I I actually was half expecting while they're eating her that she'd still be alive and missing an eye and yeah, it would have been pretty fucking awful. I and I like the idea of her surviving as as a message to the people as, as, as a, the sacrifice she's made. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that that's be far more powerful than her just dying. I, in fact, I think her dad should die in like a really embarrassing way. Still do that sword in the dragon, Cassidorius Rex, and just a spurt of fire goes up and he goes up. And it's just or embarrassing even as fuck. better, he slips on some blood from the dragon that he that And impales he's just himself filled. on a horn or yeah. one of the, uh, some sort of jagged part of the of the dragon. Yeah. Uh, slips on into its mouth and impales him's uh, head. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Just slips on the blood that he spilled. Yeah. Unnecessarily. Oh, yeah. Yes. No, I'm kind of digging that. That's, yeah. I like that. It's right. <laughs> a good ending. Yeah. yeah. It's just kind of justice. And she's now yeah. Queen yeah. Elspeth. Douche. Yeah. And yeah, and she can come with with Valerian and, and Galen, mm-hmm. they're they're carrying her. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I also want, but like, if Elspeth survives, I want kind of Valerian to also be sort of participatory in her in saving her because mm-hmm. it means like she's gotten over this jealousy, like she's yeah. secure mm-hmm. in her right. relationship with Galen. Yeah, and that comes back to the other note that Trish wrote down a while ago, and I had, didn't have a chance to sort of address is when we're talking about her jealousy. I think that she, you made a good point where Valerian thinks that Galen has been offered Elspeth's hand in marriage mm. if he can kill the dragon. I think that's a great device as well. Mm. I want to go back to Tyrion a little bit too. Yeah, we kind of like to re- over him. A I'd like bit. to redeem him a bit. Like he he definitely comes off a bit of a bully, and near the end, he's very resigned to not let this happen. I kind of wanted to switch because something stuck with me that you said that he doesn't respect his king. No. So maybe at some point he's convinced. Uh, I mean, maybe he can go out heroically in this battle with the dragon. Well, I, I want the opening scene to be that he, the opening scene to be like the initial try, the initial attempt with his original king to kill mm. this dragon where he survives. We should see those scars on his body too. Yeah. Like we should see the results of that. Yeah. And, why he fears this motive and this yeah, is he, something he needs to overcome he himself. can be covered in burns he's not a coward yeah, yeah he can be totally covered in burns he's not a coward but his kick is yes yeah but he, he's also pragmatic he's like yeah. well, this is working and I, I i know what the dragon can do mm-hmm. which is why he wants to protect this this yes. like, tradition this is your future yeah. if you survive it i i sort of want, like the idea too where he finds out about the babies and it occurs to him he's like oh no this is not going to end. If it's not going to end, well, we have babies now, and that's just going to get worse. And that's when he decides it's time to get in there. Mm-hmm. Oh, there you go. There's his moment. Is He goes in with Galen um, when Elspeth goes in to follow Elspeth. He's the, he's the one who kills the babies and right. dies he killing go, them. He goes in after the princess. Yes. Yeah. That could be his moment of redemption is he dies heroically saving what's left of the princess. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. while he's killing the babies, that's when the other dragon comes and kills him. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then you could have that battle between Galen and the Yeah, because I love how angry and devastated that, that Vermithrax pejorative, there's this pain after seeing the babies dead. is really powerful. Oh, when I, they, that's got to stay. When that yeah. nu- the nose comes up and nudges that dead baby, I yeah. cried a little. I'm yeah. not afraid to say. Yeah, no, I I totally agree. I I think that it. I mean, for lack of a better term, it humanizes the character a little bit. You get some empathy for it. I, I mean, humanizes isn't the right word because animals feel the same way. But yeah, you get the sense of empathy for Vermithax just because you now know that Vermithax is has feelings. Yeah, this is a very maternal thing. Yeah, she's been painted as old and angry. So this is a good way to show that there's been more going on here. Yeah, that they have a, a family life. It's, it's one that's alien to people, but mm-hmm. they have one. Yeah, but I and I, I like that. I think that fixes Tyrion now. The princess has pretty much got the same story, but yeah, we, her uh, story is really strong anyway. Yeah, they're probably well, the strongest story in the movie, actually. You want to make sure that she's... I like the idea of how we've done it, where she's put in place as the new ruler. So that's like her end of her story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, rather than a somewhat anticlimactic death and it could end with like rather than walking along wishing for a horse i mean yes this is star wars again but could end with the ceremony of their marriage of she marries galen and valerian from her throne and we see her regal but scarred yeah and very serious about how she's going to rule this kingdom with a tender hand keeping the kingdom in mind but she's willing to sacrifice everything for these people and it shows 
in her scars. I th- think that works really well, right? I mean, do we need to even bring in that message in that there's still magic in the world? Because that's that's the only reason for that fucking horse. Yeah, it say. doesn't. That doesn't really matter. But I'd I'd like to have that hint. It just can happen elsewhere. Maybe I, it's a something little like in that marriage, the ring just floats onto her finger. Yeah. Yeah, or or they're just kind of they're going away on the horse, and he's like, "Oh, I have a surprise for you," and it's like just something kind of just magical yeah, like with a little gem oh wait no i have a surprise for you and as they walk by something like these flowers bloom or something yeah. just something yeah. kind of or sweet better yet if you just end with the kiss yeah. and her wedding ring glows what if the ring stones are made what's left of the original there we go perfect amulet. and then when they kiss both rings glow it's simple wonder twins powers activate <laughs> yeah no that, that simplifies it and it nowhere near as hokey yeah i mean it's still hokey but it's nowhere near hokey. as hokey <laughs> it, it, it's a little bit better yeah, yeah. It's more subtle. Yeah. And makes more sense. Yeah. And we've made this a little more family friendly, even though we do have it gorier. <laughs> but let's face it. I mean, some of the worst horror in, in family friendly films are in like Bambi and Pinocchio. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it was, it's still a PG 13, PG, PG 13. Yeah. Like we're not, we're not adding a whole bunch of nudity or anything like that. Right? No, no. That, in fact, we don't even need that. Uh, there maybe should be that discovery. But. There, there's there, there's that one that moment of reveal is that one of those rare times where the suggestion of nudity makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, we could just have her coming out, and he's got a similar idea. He's walking up, and he's like, "Whoa, whoa!" And you don't have to show anything in that. It's like we all know what he's seeing. You can yeah. just show her from behind, and yeah, just from, from the waist up, so you can't really see yeah. anything. Okay, I think we're ready for some casting here. Sam, you want to go? I will go. Okay, so for my Galen, I went with Charlie Heaton from Stranger Things, because I think he's kind of got that kind of slightly gawky, doesn't look like a hero. He actually looks kind of sickly, which would be perfect for Sorcerer's Apprentice. <laughs> for my Valerian, I went with, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong, but her name is Marama Corlett. Mm-hmm. Uh, you recognize her as Aki from the Blood Drive TV series. Oh, nice. Yeah, the robot girl. Like, cause yeah, I think, yeah. Right, because if you look at her, um, her like IMDb photos and stuff like that, yeah. she can actually look quite boyish. Yeah. I, and but then of course when she looks like a girl she looks like a girl. Yeah, yeah. I thought and I thought that was important in that casting too. I yeah. was looking for something where, okay, if you dress her up just right, she could have that androgynous look. Yeah, yeah. And right now she's got her hair short, her hair cut really, really short. Mm-hmm. Right. So you just style it differently, and it's going to make her look even more boyish. Right. Until she puts on the dominatrix outfit. Go yeah. watch Blood Drive. <laughs> yes. Please do. It's highly recommended. Um, <laughs> We'll never stop talking about that show, just for the record. Never. <laughs> One season of glorious yes. awesomeness. Glorious is a good word. For my Ulrich, I went with Jeremy Irons. Speaking of aging English actors needing to play wizards, I think he'd be beautiful. He's as done it, though. Dungeons and Dragons. He, yeah, he can do it better. Yeah. Give, give him a better script and he can do it. For my Tyrion, I went with Vinnie Jones. Mm. For my Hodge, I went with Robert Carlyle. Mm-hmm. I think he'd be a lot of fun as Hodge. Uh, for my King Cassidorius, I went with Jason Fleming. Oh, nice. For my Princess Elspeth, Florence Pugh. Mm-hmm. I also cast Brother Jacopus because mm-hmm. I just wanted to cast Ian McDermott as him again. <laughs> he keeps coming back. <laughs> and then for my director, I went with Matt Reeves. Okay, uh, on to Grandma Trish here. So uh, for my Galen, I went a different way. I went Michaela Cole. I made Galen female because I thought it would be funny that they kept killing all the virgins when they're the ones who could actually save them. You could tell it'd be so fun, and she's really cool, and I think she would be good. Valerian, I went with Gemma Whalen. She's from Game of Thrones, but she's also been a lot of stuff I really like. Ulrich, I went with David Tennant because cool. I think age him, age him up or leave him as he is. He'd be fun. Mm-hmm. Tyrion, Peter Dinklage, because I have no imagination on cold medication. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds like you do. Yeah, yeah, Rory McCann. Again, Game of Thrones, but I always like to see him in a gentler, kinder role, because I like that character. Hodges, uh, Joseph Gilgan, he's in a, sh- a TV show called Brassic, and he's an older-looking fellow, but I've kind of made Valerian and Hodge the- their brother and sister rather than father-daughter, because I think that adds a different element to it. Princess Elspeth, I went with Lily Cole, because she kind of looks similar to that sort of strange princess look. Mm-hmm. And then Cassiodorus Rex, I went with David Suchet. And if you know who he is, he's an older actor, but he's also in, he was Hercule Poirot for 
a bunch of times on the BBC. And just because I kind of think I want to see how he would do with this, Terry Gilliam as the director. Ooh, I like that. I struggle with the director. Yeah, that's why I kind of, I made, this made me think of um, the Jabberwocky. Right. Where there's an idea there, but it wasn't as executed as well. Cool. Well, that is excellent casting from Trisha's grandmother. Yes. yes. <laughs> Trisha's dying, I, dying grandmother. <laughs> we brought in a crone for our fantasy episode. <laughs> well, thank you for your casting. All right. Thank you. Okay, my turn. Okay, for... I'm going to start with my Ulrich here, because this goes back to when I say English actors. And he's got a lot of friends who have played wizards, and he actually went on Graham Norton at one point going, I've never played a wizard. I think I know you. I think I was going to go with him. I think I know who you're going with Patrick Stewart. Yes, I, <laughs> I actually had him on my list. I'm like, no, you know, not this time. Yeah, I'm giving him his wish. He's getting up there. He's got that. He's old, and he's his voice is changing a bit now. And he just has that old man thing, and he's looking a little frail. We're gonna see. I think some of that come into the Picard series as well. So I think he's kind of perfect for the part, the way it plays. I wonder if they haven't just counted that, like, Prince Professor X is sort of wizardish. <laughs> you know, you know, if it, if it never comes to be, that counts in my mind. <laughs> for my Galen, and this works because he's already doing it for Spider-Man, is Peter Parker doesn't come off like a superhero, doesn't look heroic at all. Uh, Tom Holland. So I, I thought, hey. And he's a leading man. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that plays perfectly to that character. And it's a trait I kind of want to hold on to. Yeah. And that's, that's why I went with Charlie Heaton as well. But, yeah. but, and I, Tom Holland was on my short list for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely on my short list. But I, I go to Tom a lot just because I think he's so freaking phenomenal. Yeah. He's really good. And you'll notice with my cast, I kept it very British because every time we do a fantasy film, it just feels right. And yeah. It doesn't feel authentic unless you don't. And there's not an actor in my list that's not British except for Marama Corlett. And she is from the Maldives. That's fine. <laughs> Just not American or Canadian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say Canadian as well, because we don't sound anything mythical at all. No. <laughs> Emma Appleton, I cast as Valerian. You're just getting familiar with her now on Netflix's Spectacular The Witcher. So go check that out. Alex Pettifer, I cast as Tyrion. When you get that guy with a full beard, he looks kind of menacing. Trish isn't buying this, though. <laughs> I, I used to call him Alex Pretty Fur because he just is too pretty. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I like him with the beard. It, it dirties him up. <laughs> and and he, we, we had, obviously we're going through the same cast, casting list because he was another one that was on one of my short lists. I'm like, not this time, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> he had the look I wanted, so I don't know if it's going to work, but clearly not in Trish's mind. <laughs> yeah, but if you're making him a little more heroic, like, it does work. You yeah. know what? I, I'm all for trying like other guys I wouldn't necessarily think can do a, a part like i mean go for it like i mean yeah. if he he's if he surprises heroes. me i'm happy yeah, he's yeah. done heroes and asshole villains yeah. so. and if yeah. we're scarring him up a little bit why not yeah uh yes. for for my hodge uh he's gonna be a little cooler this time <laughs> <laughs> but i went with terrence stamp because he's also really old yeah, <laughs> but mean. i love how he talks and so he could be a little more of uh instead of this kind of goofy guy who cleans up after the wizards he's like uh don't leave that there you know he's really stern more like his character from priscilla queen of the desert yeah if it is him i want him to last longer yeah because we all love terrence down uh for princess elspeth i went with imogen poots who's in the spectacular the green room and the most recent uh, version of black christmas that was just out a few weeks ago and then she also in fright night Yes, I yep. do believe she is in the Fright Night remake, which yes. we did cover on our show. Yes, we did. Yeah, and another one that was on my short list. I'm like, somehow my my instinct was like, don't go with your first choice, Sam. Go <laughs> take a little deeper this time. It's a uh, good thing I did. I mean, you went pew, and he went all the way to poots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're clearly looking at the same alphabetical list. Mm. For my king, I went with Hugh Laurie because. He's, he's so good at playing a variety of roles, and I do see this as a kind of a mix of a bit of a cowardly role, and you, you kind of have to throw in a little bit of... Uh, of Black Adder's Terrible Monarch. There you go. For Valerian's father, smaller role, but I kind of felt like it needed to have some gravitas and some seriousness to it. I went with Daniel Craig. I like that, and actually I forgot to cast him, but I was going to go with one of Trisha's cast... Um, is Rory... 
Rory McCann. Yes, Rory McCann. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that if, as a blacksmith, his big imposing presence mm-hmm. would have been really great for oh, the blacksmith. And like I, I just noticed in my casting, I got Hodges mixed up with the dad, and I meant to like make it her brother. Oh, okay. That's what I meant. Right. And that was all actually I did for my cast. Hey, if if we were gonna have anybody doing grunts and growls for Vermithrax pejorative, it should still be Benedict Cumberbatch. He's got experience playing dragons. And for my director, I went with Alex Garland from Ex Machina and Annihilation. Nice. I feel like he's kind of ready to do a fantasy thing mm-hmm. and uh, do something lighter. He's just a spectacular director, and I'd like to see what he could do with a fantasy film. Yeah, I think that'd be fun. And actually, Trish just reminded me, or you just reminded me, of one of the things that did bug me about this movie was the fact that the dragons growls and stuff were mm-hmm. clearly just lions and tigers mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that has to be fixed so i think going in the direction you did is a good way to go <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah somebody who's got experience doing that kind of voice work and there's plenty of voice actors for animation who've played creatures and animals and things like that um, and do it very convincingly so or something that's a combination of noises like they do with godzilla just yeah, and the find dragons something from that's yeah yeah find something that's unique that feels interesting and it's just not reused from something that's clearly a different species yeah that's that probably my biggest pet peeve yeah mm-hmm. was yeah. how apparent that was after making it look so good you copped out well it's yeah. like in a lot of the movies we watch where it's like a shark and they make it growl that's dumb <laughs> they don't do that she's fading fast yes <laughs> no. just gonna hold on <laughs> Oh, poor Trish has got a dragon in her throat. Yes. Yeah, p- poor lady, but she made it. <laughs> what a terrible way to start the year. I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. But thank you thank you for powering through this. It's a bad yeah, you pun. could have easily, easily just called and said, you know what? I have no voice. I'm not going to make it. But you didn't. You showed it. up. Yeah. It's, but now I'm starting to really, I'm feeling like I'm dragon a bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a J joke. <laughs> that is totally yeah. a J joke. J joke. I had to Bleh. totally a J joke. <laughs> uh. Apparently, I'm fading too. <laughs> Well, we hope everybody had a great holiday season while we were off, and I hope you enjoyed our first episode for 2020. I can't believe it's 2020. Me either. Man, imagine what the world's going to smell like on April 4th, 2020. It's going to be really potent. <laughs> it's going to be a skunky day. Uh, no, it'll be April April 20th, 2020. I don't yeah. know what the hell it's Or going. April 4th, 2020, both work. Oh, say so twice then. Yeah. Right? I mean, both work. Both work. So, yeah. <laughs> we should have saved Reefer Madness for April. <laughs> we should have. We'll find something else, apparently. We'll find something else to do that's... Yeah, I'm sure we will. <laughs> Reefer themed. All right. Well, that was Dragon Slayer 1981. If you've got some great hidden cult classic we haven't covered yet let us know on our social media at invasion remake on twitter invasion the remake on facebook and instagram and invasion the remake at gmail.com send us your suggestions your corrections your comments and uh we'll uh we'll try to figure it out and see if if there's something we like we will add it to the schedule because we're always looking for a good idea and if you got a fan challenge uh the weirder the better we like it that way make it tough on us and you guys seem to like them too yeah I did have a recent request for The Exorcist and casting on that. And maybe I'll just get you guys' ideas for it, because we're never going to do an Exorcist. I'm sorry. We don't want to remake films that are really good, and that is a really good film. So that's never going to happen. But maybe we could throw it up on our social media. It's like, hey, if you want us our ideas of what a new cast for The Exorcist look like, we, maybe we can throw it out in the comments. I'm trying to give it some thought right now, but... That's a toughie. That's a toughie. And there's a reason why we don't want to remake good movies because they're already good. And that's part of why we do this show is, hey, Hollywood, stop remaking a good movie into a bad one. We exactly. can take some bad ones and make them good ones and like the, or movies that failed to find their audience the first time but deserve to find it the second time because Dragon Slayer is definitely falling into that cult category. Mm. It certainly is. And it's 
a far better film than most people realize. Yeah. And we didn't mess with it too much because we think it still works. For the most part, yeah. I was just filling out some characters and and tweaking the few little things that just don't work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or just don't work now, I yeah. should say. Much like Trish's voice. Yes. <laughs> All right. Make sure you tell your friends and family about the show. We are, of course, on a ton of different places. Leave your five-star ratings and uh, short reviews over on iTunes and Apple Podcasts to help people get more. I can't wait to hear it. (laughs) She's like, don't make me do it. Earballs. (laughs) Earballs on the show. Just trying to pull that little extra out. <laughs> that was cruel. It Funny, was a, it was but a cruel. Little cruel. <laughs> I'm sorry, Trish. <laughs> All right, so go find us with, and tell your friends where to find us, and uh, you know where it is. Or just search us on your favorite podcast platform. We're probably there. Or go to our social media. There's a link to our link tree on every single social media yeah, site. Yeah, I don't need to spend a, a minute and a half listing all the places anymore because whoever's listing already knows. So just spread the word. And if you see us on our social media posting a new episode, don't just like it. Uh, retweet it on your own walls or Facebook walls as well. It, uh, again, gets gets more Uh, earballs and eyeballs on our show and don't forget you can find us even on freaking YouTube YouTube. so uh, we are there as well but not everything is there so entire libraries are on the audio podcast but not the entire library is on YouTube when a new episode drops there do recommend you check it out sooner rather than later because you never know when it's going to disappear on YouTube exactly yeah All right, that's it for Dragon Slayer. I'm looking forward to uh, another great year with you guys, and uh, hopefully Trisha's voice will be back next week. Until then, I've been Jason. I'm always Sam. I continue to be Trish. (laughs) (laughs) Almost. And we are out of here. Looks forbidding enough, don't you think? Oh, yes. Master? No. They'd think me infirm. Belisarius wore this before he died. You know, I actually saw him change lead into gold. I could never do that. Mm, Too bad. You would have stood to inherit some real wealth. Magister, please don't talk like that. You're not going to die. Oh, but I look forward to it. All this magic, what has it accomplished?